So welcome to Stephen Rankin from uh, Gordon MacPhail, he's director of Prestige there. Um, and thank you for bringing us this wonderful 80-year-old Glenlivet to Frankfurt in Germany. It was an amazing whiskey. Um, the cask was um, uh, filled in 1940, right? 1940. Yeah. And uh, it rested at Glenlivet for a couple of years and then you took it over to Gordon MacPhail's warehouses. Uh, give us an idea how it was cared for. How often did you taste it? So, <clears throat> it was laid down on the 3rd of February 1940. It was then stored at the distillery in the warehouses up at Glenlivet until 1967, mm -hmm. so for 27 years. Now, over that time, it would have been sampled a few times. Um, that would have been by John Urquhart and his son George. Um, George would have taken over that responsibility. Now, with these old casks, what we tend to do is, the older they get, the more often we'll begin to analyse them and uh, assess them. And so we'll sample them more often. So as, as we came towards 80-year-old, we would have been paying particular attention to this, sampling it more and more often. Mm -hmm. But um, when you're sampling it, you're looking at it in comparison with its brother and sister casks from the same period and as they get consumed you then compare it to other similar casks and also using your experience. So, mm. When was the idea born to make it the oldest whiskey of the world? It's, this, is, this is an evolution because mm. of course um, we back in 2010 we sort of you know turned heads broke records when we released the 70 year old from Mortlach distillery and then of course um, in 2015 we released a 75 year old but when we're releasing those we're looking at the other casks in our portfolio and looking at how, they, how they've developed and changed mm -hmm. to say okay do we think any of these will be sublime whiskies at older than 75 maybe 80 maybe 80 you know whatever mm -hmm. so you know and so when we're looking at our inventory now we're studying them to say do we think any of these can become older because by, make, by letting them go that far, you, it's new ground, so mm. you're learning. Mm. So. Uh, I mean, the cask is not only amazing for, for its age, but it's also amazing because it is a very good example for what happens when maturating in a, in a, maturing in the cask, right? So is there something you learn from your very old casks about maturation you didn't know before? For example, that uh, the wood influence drops over time or... Yeah, absolutely. But what you have to remember is it's not the same for every cask. Every cask is different, but you do notice things changing. So we noticed with the 70-year-old Mortlick, the 75-year-old, um, even this, this, the 70-year-old Glenlivet as well, that, that they, these whiskies, particular whiskies, you can identify almost this youthfulness in them, mm. and which is surprising for such an age of whiskey and the vibrancy, the fruit that's still so fresh in there, um, and that's remarkable. So it's identifying those in amongst all the other casks as they're all maturing and being able to say, look at the way that's developing. And as you say, and until you go that, that bit further, mm -hmm. it's, that's the, you don't know until you've tried. Yeah. And that's, and, the, and unfortunately in the whiskey industry, um, or fortunately, nobody's done that yet. So. Gordon McPhail are at the forefront of that curve, so until we mature an older one, we don't know. So, uh, there are certain distilleries where you f would say that they are very good for letting them mature that long, better than others. And why is it so? If if it's so, yes, no, there definitely is, and the and the, the answer is simple: um, character of spirit, character of spirit carefully matched to the, the, a particular cast type that suits that spirit. That's what allows the aging process to be extended. So in the case of this Glenlivet, a, a very robust spirit made at a time when they were um, malting their own barley, they were creating a richer, heavier, oilier kind of spirit, stills being directly fired, etc. And not that bigger spirit put into a butt, so the biggest cask you can get, and of course, it 
has a slower rate of maturation so and therefore those two things coming together allow you to extend the maturation mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. uh, let's start talking about now and the future when you lay down stock now uh, do you reserve a certain part of that stock for long maturation every you, yeah. yeah so what we're doing is we're laying down stock today with a notional destiny to it so in that we are we we using our great experience and there for through one family for a, now 126 mm -hmm. years um and we're big we're aiming to to lay down you know particular spirits that we fill with in particular styles of cask so that they will be outstanding we we believe at 15 25 30 50 80 years mm -hmm. that's that's the goal now, will they all reach their destination? No, because the casks are all going to be ever so slightly different. They might not do exactly what you think. Mm -hmm. Therefore, but in the same way, if, if one maybe doesn't, and it's beautiful when it's 20 years old, well, we'll bottle it when it's 20 years old. But the one that we maybe thought could be, could be the 25-year-old, maybe it's showing great promise and it could go on to be much, much older. So... Is there a certain age stage where you can say, okay, this one is ideal for letting it uh, mature longer? It, it really depends. Each one is a case in point. You have to, to, to look at its maturation and its how it's developed over that time. And then, then you make that decision. Is it harder now to find casks that could uh, mature that long than, before, than in, the, in the past? Um, it's it, is it harder no it's just I think it's everything is slightly different mm -hmm. you know the world's moved on technology's moved on right from um, distillation obviously the world's changed you know and today we're the sherry industry's doing a lot of seasoning casks for scotch whiskey mm -hmm. where before Shelley was sherry was such a popular drink we were getting a lot of ex bodega casks and um, so yes there's differences there's just differences and it's just interpreting those differences and what they will, how they will impact the maturation of the spirit. So, you you are an expert for when it comes to the market for luxury whiskey. Um, in your opinion, where would you see the sweet spot age-wise, where you pay mm, mainly for the taste and not so much for the rarity? Because with the old whiskies, you pay, of course, for the rarity. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> the thing is, it's a it's an interesting question. Well, sweet spot for what? For, is it purely for taste? Because I say there's five reasons to buy whiskey. Mm -hmm. Everyone will reward you. The first is to drink. Now, the sweet spot to you will be different to me because we've got different experiences. We might like different things. Um, the 80-year-old was incredible and that was so rewarding to share it and to enjoy it with you. Um, the second reason, of course, is to do that, is to share it, is to, to bring two people together or a group of people together to enjoy, a, collect something, a unique thing between them um, that brings them together and, and mutually share that, that joy. The third reason is to gift it. Mm. Now, as we know, there's nothing better than being given a, a, a bottle of whiskey as a gift. And, but also for the giver, because inevitably you've you've taken your time to think about what they like and so it's quite rewarding to give someone s such a personal gift and the fourth reason of course is to collect now um, as you, we, we as humans love to collect things and there's a sense of achievement there's a sense of fulfillment but a great sense of fun when you're collecting things and then of course the fifth is, is a modern um, reason to purchase whiskey and that's because it is a serious investment class in its own right it, um, it, it's got it's got it's less volatile in stocks and shares, for example. Mm -hmm. But and it's it's shown great growth over many decades. So, um, however, like all investments, they can go up and down. And should they go down, please return to point one. <laughs> uh, let's conclude this with a personal question. You released uh, a series of last casks uh, from from lost distilleries a couple of years ago, I think. Uh, last year, yes. La last year, yeah. And which one is the distillery, uh, w the whiskey you will miss most personally? That's easy. So for our listeners and, and those watching, so in, for our 125th anniversary, we mm -hmm. released our last cask of Glenuri Royal 
Colburn, Glen Craig and Mostawi. And it's not a difficult question for me because the answer is Glenuri Royal because Glenuri Royal was a distillery in Stonehaven. It's just, that was the town my father was from, my grandparents and on my father's side lived in and I used to love going down for family holidays, trips down there to see my grandparents, see my aunties and uncles and, and great aunties and uncles in fact and, and it brings back so many, many memories. I'm of an age that I can remember seeing that distillery in production before it was demolished in 1985. So um, that's the one I would, I would bring back. So Stephen, thank you for taking your time and uh, thank you for bringing this wonderful whiskey to Germany. A pleasure. Thank you, Bernard. <laughs>